Well, there's no shortage of confusion and frustration in the car industry tonight over what's happened to this key climate target. It was three years ago that Boris Johnson announced a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. And just two months ago, Rishi Sunak said it remains the government's policy. That promise sparked huge investment by the car industry over the last few years. And last month, Stellantis, which makes Vauxhalls and Peugeots, began to make electric vehicles in its Ellesmere port plant after investing £100 million in the only UK factory producing just EVs, electric vehicles. Also last month, BMW pledged to spend £600 million making electric minis in Oxford, reversing a decision to move production to China. Ford says it's invested £430 million across the UK on its electric vehicle range, including in its Halewood plant at near Liverpool. Nissan has a £1 billion commitment to an EV manufacturing hub uh, in Sunderland. And just two months ago, the Indian group Tata announced a £4 billion commitment to build one of Europe's largest EV battery plants near Bridgewater in Somerset. All of that investment has been accompanied by tens of millions of pounds from the government in subsidies, all with a clear expectation that the government would stick to its plan of banning new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. The industry wanted to know if it was going to spend billions of pounds making electric cars that consumers would buy them. Now, the ban has also been key to the government's strategy of getting to net zero by 2050. Transport is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector. 25% of the UK's total emissions in 2021. And within those transport emissions, over half, there you go, comes from cars. So that was the rationale for bringing in the ban on new petrol and diesel cars. The car industry has ploughed in the cash to go electric, so has the government. There was a plan, but the plan has changed. Well, as well as cars, Rishi Sunak also announced an increase in the grant for heat pumps and scrapping plans to force landlords to make their properties energy efficient. Well, joining me now from Brighton is one of the UK's leading climate activists, Michaela Loach. Conservative MP Bob Seeley and with me here in Leeds is Chris Thompson, the managing director of home development company Sityu. Now, Chris Thompson, your company is absolutely rooted in making us greener, in heading towards net zero. What did you make of today? Well, I think for companies that are minded to make a change to net zero, I don't think this will really change them. Those companies that are purpose led or companies that have got a strategy to be ahead of the curve. But I think for there's a lot of companies that uh, need regulation to drag their standards up. And I think this sort of um, message really sends out uh, is, is slightly confusing and, and risks really people putting investments decisions back for tomorrow that they could make. today. I mean, you talk about the message boiling down his message. He said today it is not right to impose, impose more costs on working people, that many of the policies that he's scrapping or, or pausing weren't actually necessary to reach the targets anyway. Um, well, I think the, the, the message in terms of cost to families and people is, is mixed. So there's an increase in, in grants for, for heat pump schemes, which is welcomed. Um, but I think some of these heat pumps are actually commercially viable today. I think companies like Octopus announced last week that they've got uh, heat pumps that can be comparative for a typical home with gas boilers. Uh, but I think um, if it, the, the cost for families depends on, on the scenario. So if you take the retrofit, pushing back retrofit of homes, that will save landlords money, but the, the residents, the, the rental people that are, that are occupying these properties, it'll cost them more in utility bills. Uh, uh, Michaela Loach, the Prime Minister was absolutely clear today. This is not a watering down of any commitments. We're going to reach the targets anyway. I mean, that's completely ridiculous. I think that Rishi Sunak is in denial both about the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis. These targets that we have in place, they aren't like abstract or arbitrary. They can't be massaged or, or relaxed. Um, they are there so that we can ensure that we have a livable future. And by creating a um, kind of policy that is not actually prioritising reducing people's energy bills and giving us real energy security, which means moving away from volatile oil and gas, um, by doing that, Rishi Sunak is sacrificing the majority of us for the profits of 
a very small amount of fossil fuel companies. And as we've seen, we're about to go into winter again, and already millions of households across this country have had their energy um, either cut off, or there are five million households um, in this country who are in debt to their energy companies. The cost of living crisis is really very serious, um, and instead of kind of insulating people's homes or supporting them, Sunak is instead supporting um, the fossil fuel industry who already make billions. What he was saying today about that cost of living crisis is that it's just not fair right now to impose what he said was sometimes 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 pounds on people to make these changes right now. What do you think young people will make of that? Because they're affected by the cost of living crisis too. I think that young people, what we want is our energy bills to be lower in the short and long term. And if this government had instead focused on insulation, which they see, still seem to want to ignore, um, we would have had lower energy bills now. Um, we're currently in a situation where energy bills are still double what they were two years ago. That's a huge amount of money. Um, and instead of focusing on things like insulation, like what the public actually want, like the Prime Minister is currently really behind on what the public want. The public want um, climate policy, the public want insulation, they back these things. And instead of prioritising them, he He's kind of creating these kind of false arguments um, that, that aren't really real um, in order to make this into a culture war that it really doesn't need to be. What's the reality is that people just want a safe home, they want a safe future and they want to have low energy bills as well. Well, Celie, let me bring you in here. He's enraged the environmentalists, of course, he may not be too worried about that. He's frustrated and in many instances angered businesses. The car industry seems pretty apoplectic. Many in his own party are very unhappy. He's gambling a lot, isn't he, that this will go down well with voters? I don't think many in his party are that unhappy. I think most of us are relieved because most of us are hearing uh, that our constituents are going to find it very difficult to start to afford to this stuff. And by the way, this has got absolutely nothing to do with culture wars or any um, arguments of that nature. This is about understanding that we have a prime minister who is really keen that if we have ideas, we need to know how we're going to get there and how they're going to be paid for. And forcing people to take heat pumps and forcing people out of their cars now when people are going to struggle and in some areas that technology is not there yet is not going to be productive in the long run because you're going to alienate people. And the so-called ULES rebellion is a good example of that where you have a Labour mayor who claims that he's taxing Londoners for health reasons when the evidence, the science, shows that the ULES charge and the purpose of ULES is marginal at best. I mean, and that creates it, you, cynicism in a society. I mean, you say it's not about culture wars. As we established at the top of this programme today, he stood there boldly scrapping policies that hadn't ever actually been made form, formal policies. He stood there talking about, we won't force people to have seven bins. I've scrapped it. We won't interfere with the number of passengers in your car. I've scrapped it. This was populist politics at its very best, wasn't it? Um, so Sorry, I'm, I'm going to focus on the, on the big picture stuff here. But if you well, look he didn't, since 19... in that instance. I think those are marginal points. And I think the central point of what he was saying is that we have gone further and faster in this country. Our uh, carbon emissions, the greenhouse gases that we produce, are down by half since 1990. Now, half of that is for good reason. We've stopped using coal-fired power stations and half because we're exporting our industry to China. And one can argue about the worth of that. But if you look at France, 22% down. The United States, okay. the same. As. If you look at China, their greenhouse emissions have gone up 300% so, in that period. So we are just, ahead of all the other G20 nations. Michaela Loach, just respond to what Bob Seeley is suggesting here, that we're doing well and this will uh, we'll do even better with this trajectory. I, I don't see how you can take what the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said in that conference and see that as that we're going to be doing better. Um, the reality is, is that this is a pushback on climate policy that is being done not based on science, not based on even what the people want, but instead based on trying to create an issue that doesn't really exist around um, what the public support for net zero and the public support for climate policy. What we actually need is to remove our dependency on, on gas. We are one of the countries in Europe that is most dependent on gas and is really, really far behind when it comes to heat pumps and other things that actually would support people's um, ability to to be able to pay their energy bills or live in a safe and warm home. And so what we need instead is to um, have this government be focusing on things like insulation, focusing on things like supporting families to be able to put in heat pumps so that everyone can actually be able to live not only a safe Chris, uh, present now, but also a safe um, home in the future. Chris Thompson, very briefly, I mean, are you confident that we will still meet the target? 
I think there's there's a lot of doubt around it, and it requires businesses and citizens to do everything they can to treat this like a crisis that it is. And so we need to galvanise behind that message, and we all each, each need to be doing more and going faster than we can. There are technologies that exist right now that are commercially viable, and we should be pushing those as fast as we can and in, incentivising those that are marginal in viability terms to, to reduce those, those costs. Bob Seeley, there's obviously the environmental argument which, you know, we're, we examine. But very briefly, on the politics of this, Lord Eben, former chair of the Committee on Climate Change, says there's a bigger problem for the government. No one will believe them on any commitment going forward. Very briefly, if you would. I, I disagree. We have to take people with us, and that's what we're going to be doing. I'm delighted that we've had this conversation this evening. I'm delighted that Rishi has said what he said, because actually it makes it more likely oh. that we can take people with us and achieve these goals. Bob Seeley, thanks to all of you.